Ah, hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. Ah, welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Ah, this is episode uh, 105, uh, where I had the immense pleasure to have on the podcast today, uh, Kola. He is a communication skills coach, a barrister. Uh, we talked about many a thing from his time in Nigeria. Uh, and basically, when he started his uh, consultancy, uh, the Great Speech uh, consultancy and his work with a hundred black men are uh, from of London from no of London uh, as well as uh, many other things along the way he is a very interesting chap I wish I had more time with him but I'll definitely get him back on the podcast sometime in the near future uh, thank you uh, very much for your time please enjoy the podcast and have a exceptional day yeah peace <laughs> Ah, hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo! Okay, this is episode, can't believe it, 105, where today I have, uh, I have to cross my fingers, uh, Colorary Shanaiki. Ah, uh, you know what? Uh, okay, I, I have butchered his name, but yes. To his like good friends, which sometime I, in the future I hopefully will be, it's Kola. How are you today, sir? <laughs> I'm very well, Muyo. Oh. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, thanks for for butchering my name, but that's no. all right. I'm not no. gonna I'm not gonna make it hard for you today. I no. should give you more grief actually, because oh. you know you should. Be, I should give you more grief, but I won't. I'm yeah. I'm Kola. I'm good. I'm good. Oh, you, you know what? Look, come on now. Look, my name's Miwa. Miwa DB. Look, look. I have to Englishize my name, Anglify my name. So, like, I don't have a 45-minute conversation. Look, we almost had a 45-minute conversation about how to pronounce your name. I. <laughs> so, look, I'm not the first or the last to get your name wrong. I know that for a fact. No, uh, you, you definitely aren't. I mean, I've, I've had it since, uh, you know, school, <laughs> right? Uh, at least school in England, anyway. Uh, yeah. But although I've been, I've been much more, much more kind of, focused on it in terms of not letting people do certain things with it which people do do um but you know generally man just i'm collar i'm good ah yes yes you know what well, you are an interesting cat because like yeah communication skills coach and barrister like okay look I'm, i know as a barrister you meant to like be a good speaker a good communicator but the combination of the two what led to that come on now yeah, well, so it's interesting you say you have to be a good communicator. I know many viruses that aren't that great at communication, so it's not necessarily hand in hand, uh, albeit you're kind of doing your, you know, you're, you're giving speeches and stuff in court. Mm. But I mean, in, in terms of my case, it was relatively straightforward in that, yeah, I've been a barrister since 98, so what's that, 22 years, and probably... I would say maybe 15 years in or so is when I started to get asked for help and assistance with public speaking specifically, because people assume that, oh, you're a barrister, you must talk well. I had a couple of friends who kind of had presentations or pictures to give and they asked for some help. I initially, I was like, look, I speak in court. That's totally different to speaking in the corporate world. Yeah. But I still kind of gave them some tips. I enjoyed the process and then just kind of took it on from there. Ah, I see. So with regards to your sort of first sort of coaching gig, which you were like, yes, you're now being paid to be a communicator. What was, what did that entail? Well, so that was actually specifically a, an, a kind of like an accountancy software company that I'd met one of the, not the CEO, but kind of a high level uh, lady in, in the company uh, at a networking event. And I did a little bit of training at the networking event on presentation skills. And she really liked that. And so she said, look, we've got an away day. I need, we need somebody to come and train our staff. Can you do that? So I was like, yeah. So I went and did that, really enjoyed the process and then kind of built it from, built it on from there. Wow. <laughs> it must be kind of a trippy thing. Like from, like from that point all the way back, like when you were in Nigeria, like basically as a journalist, did you actually sort of foresee 
you sort of like going, okay, you know what? One day I'll be in the UK. I'll be a barrister doing communications. And like, yeah, a journalist for, was it Newswatch uh, magazine? Yeah, Newswatch magazine. That was really, that was actually a kind of an interim phase. So I had already been studying in the UK. Mm. And then once I'd done my studies in the UK, I went back home to Nigeria to um, do my um, national youth service, basically. Because the plan was always to kind of go back, whether immediately or not, but I was going to go back. So in order to be able to work in Nigeria, you have to do your, your national youth service. And so that involved a couple of weeks at military camp, which was fun. <laughs> and then you work in kind of an organization. Some people became teachers. Some people worked in banks. Um, I worked in a news magazine called Newswatch, which was kind of a really, uh, of its day, it was one of the two main magazines that were kind of protest magazines because at that stage it was still a military dictatorship right. and uh, I think it was General Abacha at that time uh, he was just like a brutal guy you know and so this was a news magazine that had kind of a history of protest and writing you know kind of investigative journalism mm. the owner of the magazine had a few years previously been firebombed and killed by the government so it was you know so it was real stuff right as so i actually remember coming the first article i did for the company uh for, for the for the for the magazine you know i'd got because i'd been in england right so i'm fired up you know oh yeah dictatorship is terrible blah, blah. So i wrote an article you know fire you know fire i'm the, ready come on know, the editor brought me in and I saw the article just with red lines through almost everything. And his and that was the first thing I'd submitted to him. And his first words for me to me were, Kola, you're not here to get arrested, all right? Just just take it easy for now. You know, it's like don't be your like first some London boy coming in here and you know, first article he's locked up. So that was an interesting uh, and so I did that for a year. And then I came back to the UK and then kind of pursued like becoming a barrister and all of that. So the journalism thing was kind of just an interim phase. I wasn't really a very good journalist, to be honest. Yeah, you know what? Like, this is the thing. I was like getting, all, when I was like, when I was doing my research, I was like getting this sort of chimes of Alexander Hamilton coming from, like coming through there. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, just be like nonstop. Okay, yeah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> No, and uh, you know those guys fought for their country. I was not about to start fighting no civil wars, man. <laughs> oh man, look, but this way you haven't been like. If you went to Nigeria in the ninety, like eighties and nineties, like let's just say you didn't go to Nigeria if you didn't sort of live through a coup or a dictatorship at that period yeah. of time. Believe yeah. you me, uh, I when I visited, I, I felt like it was, I was jinxed because two times I went. No, three times, and two of those times, yeah, there was a coup going on, or it was moving into leadership. It was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know what? You you don't really appreciate democracy until you've lived under a dictatorship. So, so I, I think I think there's there's some benefits to that. Uh, it makes yeah. people appreciate freedom all the more. Yes, and like this is the thing. It's one of those things where you hear people over here and like for the last elections go, you know what? There ain't no point in voting, <laughs> and you're like kind of like. Yeah. A, yeah you don't know <laughs> you don't yeah. know if you had to really sort of pay the price some people in this world have to pay just to sort of have a voice you don't know and look let's just say uh with recent times um very recent times in nigeria especially with what's gone on like no more than was it two three weeks ago with the whole sort of mm, people the, the like, sars the sars yeah. protest yeah yeah i mean that was so what was very sad about that is, is it's not that that hasn't been going on in terms of br brutality, because it really has, right? Okay, yes, we are a democracy, still a young democracy in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. But you kind of hope that even though you know that things are still quite brutal in many instances, you hope that there has been progress and improvement. Mm. But then when you get subjected to things like that and that comes out to the open it's really quite depressing because it just reminds you that the process of becoming a mature democracy mm. where civil rights human rights are just 
ingrained into the fabric of society rather than can easily be attacked and brutalized with impunity. It's really when you go through the things like that, it just reminds you that, yeah, the process of becoming kind of a fully um, de democratic society is a long, hard process. Mm. And if you know your history, you know that that's what every other country has been through. So it's not surprising that we're going through it too. Yeah. And like, there's a thing, like people will go, yeah, why isn't it like that right now? You can't really hyper accelerate these things. Yeah, not at all. Yeah long sort of slow growing process mm. and like getting that getting through that is always a bit of a difficult one because like this is the thing like the way i kind of look at nigeria now with its sort of potential for the future i see it as being a the like the tech country of africa because like there are a number of talented people like Yes, if anyone's read those emails from a certain prince or two, <laughs> something like this. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and look, if there, there are a number of... I'm still waiting for my money, by the way, from one of those things. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like... Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the prince <laughs> promised me millions. Where are they? <laughs> oh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but with that sort of talent out there, which is now turning their sort of attention to more legitimate means... You could see that sort of, I could see that sort of being in Nigeria's future. The SARS thing recently kind of was like, yeah, echoes of the past and like going, okay, you guys, like, you guys have got a lot of work to still do, but there is a bright, shiny future. I see. Oh, Nigeria. Yeah. Um, I mean, tech wise, I think East Africa is is ahead of us from the tech perspective. Uh, you know, places like Rwanda are really, really um, pushing it in terms of tech really? and being a tech hub. But there's a there's a lot of tech in Nigeria. But I think the Nigeria is, is more that we're just kind of naturally entrepreneurial, just mm. have always been. You know, it's, and it's one of the things. So there's there's extensive poverty in Nigeria, which is really underappreciated because there's so much wealth in the country as well. Mm. That kind of gets swept to the carpet. So there's extensive, hard poverty. And I, I'm when I say poverty, right? I so poverty is either absolute or relative, right? Relative <laughs> poverty is like here. I think poverty is defined as you know I don't have. Um, you know, a, a TV subscription or something like that. Like it's relative. It's like, mm. okay, that's the level most people are. If you're under that level, that's considered poverty. Absolute poverty is, yeah, where's, where are we going to eat today? You know, what are we going to eat? Or did we eat three days ago? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so there is absolute poverty in Nigeria, which is tough. But at the same time, that natural entrepreneurial spirit means you never really see people defeated right in that kind of hopelessness We're always hustling always trying something you know you'll have seen on the road like you know it's you know you're on the road like you're driving right <laughs> and the street hawkers will include disabled guys you know chasing you for you know either they're selling something or okay they're begging or whatever but no one is just sitting around waiting for benefits because there aren't any no yeah so so there is that entrepreneurial spirit which i think will stand us in good stead our problem hasn't ever really been economics it's been political mm, yeah shocking political leaders well like this is thing um like i'm not sort of absolutely versed with sort of nigerian politics but let's just say as a like when i was a lad visiting in the like 80s like there was like free coups ever for like this <laughs> yes yeah um like yeah airport shut down yeah i like you know that film terminal uh by mm -hmm. uh, look, yeah that was that was me for a time me right. and my mum for a time in lagos airport like yeah, yeah i walked around that place like i owned it i was like yes walk, i think i walked into areas where i shouldn't have walked into does that yeah uh, like security like it's him <laughs> off yeah. you go but yeah yeah uh so i know that side of things but yeah oh god but yes i i managed to get over that i'm here now so yeah like i mean born and raised <laughs> yeah raise and up. uh over 100 episodes in of your podcast which is pretty special well you know what i mean i got like you know like consistency driving forward like you know what i mean uh, i won't lie there was some 
rusty times in the beginning, but I can get into yep. that later because, oh boy, <laughs> let's just yep. say there's a couple of podcasts, especially in the early days where it was like, oh, <laughs> well, you know, you know, they say if you're not embarrassed by your early days, you weren't really committed. So, you know, <laughs> I, oh, yeah. Yeah, all got to go through it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're, you're a very kind man for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> like, after leaving Nigeria, you like basically, what is the great uh, speech consultancy? So that is the consultancy that as a result of the kind of public speaking and communication skills work that people were just asking me for help with, you know, yeah. without me actually really trying for it, that although I'm a barrister, I decided, you know what, I really enjoy this work. I should actually set myself up properly so that I can actually do the work. Right. So it kind of came backwards in terms of, you know, normally you, you know, you set up a business, you start putting yourself out to the world and then you get clients. Mine was backwards. It was, I had nothing to do with that, but I was just getting some clients. So I thought, okay, I might as well set things up. And then having done that, then I was able to say, yes, I'm a communication skills um, coach or trainer. Uh, or consultant um, and that kind of lent itself to speech writing to training staff to coaching executives that kind of thing right now this is the thing with speech writing like that is one of the things which I kind of always look on with a bit of reverence because getting a right speech to match the right time is such a difficult thing and like it's very rare you sort of see it uh, happen in person like in your sort of lifetime people sort of reflect upon the great speeches of the past like m like Martin Luther King like uh, Churchill like hey for some people Hitler but that's another story but um, I think the first time I can like really sort of where it's like oh my god wow uh, it was President Obama like this was when he lost New Hampshire yeah and his concession speech when he gave that speech, I was like, I was like, oh my God, you're gonna win this. And I was like, my jaw was to the ground because it was like, wow, amazing. And like to who like whoever wrote that speech for him, like I'm like, oh my God, they got the moment, they got it right, and it is a tall order. I don't expect to see um the outgoing president of the United States. Uh, be able to maybe uh, get something like that crafted for him but we you never know you might surprise us all yeah well um with the interesting with thing with obama is that he has been has always been an outstanding public speaker in terms of a great keynote speech mm. right great set piece speech and he um his speech writer in fact uh, gosh, I'll have to remember the guy's name, but there, so there's a group of guys that have now done the podcast Pod Save America, uh, which is a massive podcast. So they're all former Obama, Obama staff, um, staff kind of members. Mm. Um, and one of his speech writers, uh, I'll try, yeah, John Favreau, uh, shares the same name as a guy, director of like Marvel movies, but it's just a totally different guy. Uh, so he was Obama's speech writer or one of his chief speech, speech writers. And he started the podcast Pod Save America. It's a really good kind of political podcast in the US. So Obama was brilliant at the set piece speech because mm. he had a great voice, you know, that kind of great baritone that means you really are carried away with it. He was fiercely intelligent, right? He's a Harvard Harvard Law, you know, <laughs> professor, right? So Columbia, he's got he's got the intelligence. Harvard Law Review, God. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. And... What he also understood in terms of public speaking for things like politics is that what people look for when they are looking for their politicians is not improvement. Mm. It's not something slightly better. It's always transformation or change, right? And he understood that and tapped into it. So with his 
speech, which was that one New Hampshire was the yes, we can speech where he kind of used that refrain. Mm. What he was doing was tapping into the American spirit and saying, look, right now we are broken, right? Because this was Bush, you know, <laughs> this is the end of Bush's, which is a appalling presidency on many accounts. Uh, you know, they'd had the Iraq war. There was now a deep recession because of the, um, 2008. the 2008 crash, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody was looking and crying out for change. That's why his whole thing was hope and change. Mm -hmm. And then Yes, We Can was about we've lost our self-belief. We can believe in ourselves. So yes, we can. We can do it. So that's why he was very effective. And then he's just got great turn of phrase. Incidentally, Actually, I prefer, so prefer is probably the wrong way to say it, but I, I, I love Michelle Obama as a public speaker more than I do Barack Obama. Mm. Because Barack is, is austere, he's very stately. Yeah. Michelle, her style of public speaking is very melodic and it's very storytelling orientated that she just gets you and sucks you in. So they're both brilliant. Um, but yeah, those kind of just different styles. Ah, I tell you one thing. Uh, have you uh, read or listened to the audio book of Michelle Obama's like autobiography? No, I. So I've got it both as an audio book. I bought it for my wife, mm. um, and then when she came to London and did a little kind of um, um, kind of meet and greet, I guess in London, like a but you know on a big scale in the O2 or something. Yeah, I got my wife and my daughter tickets to that, so they oh. went. So Michelle Obama is a is a hero in our in our in our household. But I haven't yet read it or listened to it. It's kind of there, and I just need to start. It. What um, What do you think? Have you read it? I have like got it on audiobook, listened to right. it, and I like, basically, I mean. Like her life, and I've got to say, like this is the thing. There's a guy called David Goggins. Where, like, if you ever seen David Goggins, yeah, his upbringing was, ooh, <sighs> yeah, heavy to say the least. Right. And mm -hmm. like, she didn't sort of have that sort of like ah dreadful struggle, if you get what I mean. Not a broken house and stuff like this, stable family, everything like this. But one of like one of the key things which she learned when they were running like to like become the first fat like the first family and everything like this is she was doing the speeches and everything like this and she was just like she was saying like she believed she was saying the right things and everything like that and oh boy they were, they were just simply going yeah points were dropped points were dropped points were dropped and they were like okay they, so they called her in and she was like, yeah, look, I'm doing what you want me to do. I'm doing the speeches. Blah, blah, blah. And like, you know what I mean? She was, how, as you can imagine, getting a little bit huh, angry <laughs> with it all. And she like, went, okay, look, Michelle, yeah. Watch the speech. What do you think? She was like, it's great. It's fine. And she went, okay. Took, they muted it and they played it again. What do you think now? And she was like, oh, it was like, because like, this is the thing. One of the things I don't think people actually connect is when you do a speech and like, you know, you know this better than I, because you're a consultant and everything like this. I'm the, it's a case of you can deliver the words, but like having the right sort of gestures at the right time can just basically add to it or throw it off. And what she was doing was throwing it off. And I only know this because I listened to the book and I was like, ah, oh, that's, that is something never would have thought of because I would have been like, yeah, just, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was, so I, I haven't read that. I haven't read that as I said yet, but it, it makes perfect sense in that the kind of the two elements of your public speaking will be your content, what you say. Mm. And then your delivery, how you actually say it. Yeah. And the how you actually say it part can have an outsized impact on the message that people receive. And how you actually say it is the part that affects things like your body language and your tone of voice, you know, which includes hand gestures, includes micro expressions on your face that will convey to people whether you truly believe what you're saying or not, right? <laughs> you know, things like that. So it sounds like, although she was saying the right words, she hadn't gotten to the point where she had coordinated that with maybe her body language, her tone and things like that. And the other thing I think that's probably relevant is 
that was the first black proper black um you know man well presidential candidate and first lady candidate that really had a realistic shot which means it was a, probably the first time that a lot of non-black people had paid attention to somebody black running for the highest office that brings with it a huge amount of scrutiny mm, yeah. and also you know she had to deal with that stereotype of the angry black woman that meant even if she wasn't being angry a lot of people would project that onto her so i imagine she therefore had to manage her style of delivery particularly carefully so that everything that she did and said conveyed kind of the right level of acceptability to people so they'd be willing to vote for her yeah or vote for him and her i guess well yes like this is the thing there, there's been many a person that come yes we want like michelle to run for president and michelle does not want that for herself yeah. whatsoever like, yeah. no. why 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 would she man it's like she's already top of the world yeah and all she'd get is grief and all she'd get she would just tarnish her image because then she'd have to make hard political decisions which will alienate half the country yeah why 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 do that to yourself <laughs> <laughs> no indeed like one of the things in my research which i like i did like what you did you did a sort of analytical breakdown of like the police chief uh for like george floyd and like you know and you were like going, yes this is what he did and like how like he was talking in crisis management and stuff like this which when you did that sort of breakdown, it was very interesting to see. And I don't know, like, you should do more of those breakdowns because I think it would be very, I think it'll be very insightful, like, because you are, okay, you are, okay, great. Because in every speech, there's a little bit of a magic trick somewhere along the line. And like, yeah, uh, will you be doing more of those? Or is it a case of that was just a one-off you wanted to do? No, no, no. I, I actually will. And I actually am. So that particular one was uh, police chief Arredondo, I think, or something like that, um, mm. who was the police chief in charge of the officers who had killed George Floyd, basically. Yeah. So you can imagine the pressure situation that he was in. So I remember watching it. I think I saw it on YouTube or something, or maybe I saw it initially on Sky or something like that. And I remember watching it thinking, wow, OK that was well handled considering mm. the moment considering the pressure that was well handled and so i was kind of compelled to do something about it and since then a lot of people have said oh i really like that can you do a more analysis so on my podcast for instance i'm currently the season i'm in on my podcast i'm currently doing analysis of great speeches so i just did one on martin luther king's i have a dream speech yes i was a, the next one that was about to come out was about um Actually, one of my favorite speeches, which is one given by Queen Elizabeth I back in the kind of 17th century or 16th, 17th century. Um, but since um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won the, um, the election, I thought I was actually, I'm going to actually do one on a recent speech given by Kamala Harris. Mm. So that's the next one that's going to come out next week, actually. So I'm actually starting now to do that kind of analysis of speeches that people can see because i've realized that people get a lot out of it from just being able to say okay ah so that's why this works or this doesn't work maybe i can use that for my own kind of communication style yeah like this is the thing like doing those guys and like put it this way um steve jobs like when he did like yeah the apple mm -hmm. presentation for yeah uh, like the iphone or yeah. the uh, like it's I the, the 2007 unveiling of the iphone probably the greatest business presentation ever given uh, oh yes that period of time <clears throat> when they were truly on like fire because mm -hmm. like the one that was like just trying stumbling over my words to get out was the macbook air that okay. presentation like it was yeah. Just like yeah talking away and like it was like yeah it was like yeah. sort of it was like oh i was like Okay, yeah, why do you have a, and he pulled out the envelope. Yeah, there. from the like, envelope, oh. right, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, just literally like, what the, I was like, oh, look, I'm, look I'm, I'm a PC man myself, and that, that it was close, so I was like, going, you know what, maybe I can give up a kidney. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I yeah. No, I mean, Steve Jobs was brilliant at that, and actually, 
Apple have lost a lot by him not being there because if you watch the presentations now and Tim Cook's lovely guy, you know, obviously very capable guy. So it's not, yeah. this, isn't, this isn't any issues on his ability as a CEO, but now their presentations are very formulaic. So it's, we have a new phone. Here's John to tell you all about it. And here's yeah. a video and they do a nice video with great graphics. And then they talk about, you know, the processor speeds and all this kind of stuff. Steve Jobs never did that. Steve Jobs focused on, well, what is the benefit to people of the fact that it has a great processor speed and how can I show that? So the thing with the envelope was, yeah, in, you know, that signaled to people, this is a light, compact machine. It's not bulky. It's literally, I can carry it in an envelope, right? Or with the iPhone, uh, so the iPod, when they brought it out, right? They didn't say, you know, it's got a hard drive that's X, Y, and Z. I mean, they did that in the kind of for the tech geeks. But in terms of the actual presentation, it was a thousand songs in your pocket. Mm. And that was it. And it's like everyone got it because it's okay. Yeah. However, you're doing this magic, I don't care because you're giving me a thousand songs in my pocket. Absolutely. Remember at that time, it was CD, CD players, right? <laughs> Portable CD players, which were even worse than like Walkmans. Walkmans at least didn't jump. Portable yeah. CD players were bigger. You play them and you'd be walking around, they'd skip you like, oh man. Yeah, but like, this is the thing. There was also mini disc. And like, you know yeah. what? Mini yeah. disc was not a cheap system to have. No, nope, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> and if you yeah. paid that money for that, you were like, okay. And then, yes, yeah. the iPod. So, yes, yeah, so that, that was a good example of mm. strong communication because the iPod was not the first MP3 player. No. But they worked out what was important to people and what the message around it was that would actually resonate. Mm, yeah, and like this is the thing. They, I think, I, I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but they kind of focus on the why more so and then yes. basically everything else. So they started from where people would, they started from the middle and sort of worked their way out where people yeah. started from the outside and worked their way in. And yeah, yeah, that's the... Um, so it's, I think you've probably seen it. It's the Simon Sinek TED talk where he talks about starting with why. Uh, and it's very, very, really, really innovative um, piece of, of kind of thought leadership actually by him and very, very much applies. Mm. Like, but like what I don't understand is why pe more sort of organizations don't start with the why. And like it's... You, you know what I mean? Because you see Apple do what they do. And it's a case of, yeah, you can copy the hardware and stuff like this. But when it comes down to the sort of message they put out, no one seems to actually copy the sort of message style or structure that Apple does. It's weird. It's like, it's, it's like they, don't, they don't have a pattern. Listen, on it. listen man, 90% of people work in jobs because it pays them right mm. <laughs> your why comes when you're doing things out of passion mm. so steve jobs was a man who did everything out of his passion for what he was doing he really didn't so you know if you think about steve jobs you th when people think about steve jobs nobody thinks about the fact that he was one of the richest men on earth right you don't why because actually he was never about that he was always about the purity of the technology and he was a really into music so he did it from that point of view mm. but he was one of the wealthiest guys on earth but because he didn't do it because of money you never thought about that um but most people you know and it's life right you're in a job because it kind of pays you well or well enough for you to stick with it but you would do something else if it paid you better so when you're doing that, you don't, you don't start with why, right? You just say, okay, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? And that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Was that your sort of rousing speech you were given when you were back in Lagos? <laughs> <Is that gone? laughs> well, no, you know, well, so you actually, funny enough, in, in, in Lagos, you tend to find there is much more people are doing it i say not the passion but it's like a there's a commitment because there isn't a safety net for oh if that messes up i'll just go into something else it's no you better be committed to what you're doing because 
you know, it, things don't, things literally don't grow on trees. So be committed. Mm, no, like truth be told. Yes, I agree. Like with regards to that, is this how you sort of got involved with a hundred black men at, of London? Because like you talk about passion, you talk about commitment and like, yeah, we're like taking that sort of stance uh, from a passion point of view, rather than sort of just like, I'm just punching a ticket to get a wage type situation. Yeah, I, I maybe, I guess if I look back on it that way, I mean, at the time, all it was, was I'd kind of reached the age, I think it was around 30 or something like that. Um, I'd reached the age where I felt I'm fine personally, right? I'm, you know, I, I'm working in a job, I'm secure. Mm -hmm. I know that I could continue my life doing this and do well for myself, but it's not enough. Mm. You know, I, I'm one of those fortunate people that I have had every privilege in life in terms of stable household, stable family, parents, you know, work their butts off to get, get me and my brothers to one of the best public schools in the entire country, which means one of the best schools in the world. Um, and then go to university and all of that. So I've had every privilege and opportunity. And as a result, I always felt you don't have the right to take all of that opportunity and just do it for yourself. You really have to do something more with it. Uh, so I always had kind of a compulsion to do more than just work as a barrister. Uh, and my passion has always been, how do we improve the, the kind of the lives of the black community? So when I was kind of ready to do that kind of work, um, a friend or a little girlfriend at the time knew about the hundreds. So she put me onto them. I turned up to it and I just really enjoyed it. So I, I kind of got, got, got in deep. Yeah. So what do they do? May I ask? Yeah. So the, the 100 Black Men of London is a chapter of the 100 Black Men International, which is actually about 100 chapters around the world, mostly in the U.S., Mm -hmm. started in 1963 the first chapter in new york and it was really just basically a group of brothers that got together and say what would happen if we got 100 men 100 black men committed to serving the community mm -hmm. uh in specifically in four key areas mentoring education health and wellness and economic empowerment uh and all wrapped up in kind of showing leadership within the black community so it started there then it kind of grew to other chapters in the US and then became in the kind of a national organization in the US and then extended internationally, Turks and Caicos, Birmingham had a chapter, although they're defunct now. And then London had a chapter in 2001. So that's the chapter that I'm a member of and I became president later on as well. Yes, yes. Like VP programs and then president, yes. Yeah, yeah. Hard within the group, like yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it's always cool when, you know, people refer to you as Mr. President. It's like, <laughs> I, I understand why Donald Trump doesn't want to leave. It's like, that Mr. President, is, yeah. there's something about it that's like, oh, that's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> yeah. Donald Trump was president before he became president of the United States already. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, yeah like, he yeah. just, <laughs> he, like, he's on a, like, different level. But, like, yeah. Yeah. Like with like with a hundred black men of London and the different chapters across the world, like yeah. So trying to sort of get that message out to the sort of mentoring uh, youth to come up next, like through either economics, like this is the sort of jobs we do, and like these mm -hmm. sort of options are there. Like, what have you found with some of the greatest challenges uh, being involved in this organization? So the probably the the biggest challenge working with young people mm. is to break through the barrier that has been created or imposed by lack of belief that they are surrounded with and that lack of belief can be manifested in different ways it can be in school they are seen you know black boys especially but black girls as well in school they are seen as disruptive or uninterested or uncommitted and therefore not smart right it can be household being broken and so you don't have parents that are believing you or that they're, they're there to support you mm. it can be 
media which portrays black people in all sorts of ways and the only successful black people that you would often see were musicians or sports people um you know it can be your immediate environment if you're surrounded by other by gangsters and things like that and so it's like that's a limiting obstacle because the, all you ever see is that so there's so many things that impact on the self-belief and aspiration of young black boys and girls and that's the biggest challenge as to how do you break through that and what we found is get black men together in particular we, there's black women that actually volunteers in the organization as well um, mm. but prim primarily black men to challenge that stereotype that black men don't get involved and aren't committed to you know their community and their children and then get them to interact with young black boys and girls so that they see other well-organized, disciplined, caring, smart black people that look like them that they can aspire to be mm. and that they're willing to listen to. Right. So the kind of breaking through that limiting self-belief is the biggest challenge because once you crack it, you just see transformation. You just see, you know, you know, we will have when 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 parents bring their kids to us, typically it'd be very often to be single mothers would bring their kids to us. So they want a male influence in their in their son's life or something like that. Yeah. They will come nervous with like, yeah, you know, in school, you know, he's been kicked out or he's on the school, you know, the verge of exclusion. They say he's destructive, they say he's this, they say he's that, and they'll drop him off to the mentoring program. And you can see that they're nervous, like, oh, and we say, yeah, okay, off you go. And we have a parents program. So they we shunt them into the parents program. So they're not even in the room with the kids we're mentoring. But you can see they're nervous because all their kind of life of their child, they've been told the child is bad and wrong and won't achieve and all of that. Then we get the kids in, right? And all you realize is, and you know, it's, I can't complain, but our children generally are educated by young white women, right? That's just the reality of who tends to be teachers in this country, tends to be young white women. And many of them just aren't equipped or trained or able to understand the cultural significance of dealing with black boys and girls. But when they're in our environment, we get it, right? So they don't even bother sparking or giving grief because it's like, yeah, well, you're gonna, well, you're gonna tell me, you know, don't, don't start, <laughs> don't even bring that nonsense here. So as a result, they come in with great attitudes and they show these incredible insights, incredible commitment. They have to do homework assignments. They they stay with us for, if they go the full way, five years and each year they graduate and each year they're coming back once a week, once every two weeks, total commitment. And, you know, you'll get reports of how it's changed his life. You know, he's now doing this in school and teachers are saying, oh, he's suddenly changed. But like, he didn't change. He is who he is. We just cleared out the rubbish that you guys have been trying to impose on him. Mm, yeah, like this is the thing with regards to sort of schools and like when you go, yeah, so it's mostly white ladies, like the whole thing with their education system. And I've known this from a friend who worked as a teaching assistant. They like many of the teachers which come into say London, sort of inner city schools and everything like this, they're like, they're fresh face, mm -hmm. uh, new, like new meat for the grinder. And yeah. basically optimism, optimism and all of this shiny hopes of like greatness as being a great teacher first year second year real like end of first year slash second year reality hits and by the time it's their third year like they either blossom into a great teacher a mediocre teacher or they're gone and the whole thing yeah yeah i mean so i don't want to be down on teachers in that i mean <laughs> One, not that I didn't know before, but one thing lockdown teaches you <laughs> is that thank God for teachers, right? Because when you've got your kids at home, you're like, oh man, I've got to do like algebra with my kids. I'm like tearing my hair out, what little hair I have left. <laughs> um, so, you know, you've got you to appreciate teachers and teachers generally, especially the way, you know, particularly public school, the, the, the public, um, I don't mean public schools, but um, state school system yeah. of education is basically they get the they get 30 kids mm -hmm. they get a curriculum that is far too much 
they get no resources and they're told educate these kids and half of them because you know half of them have come from different circumstances often can't speak english yet yep. well enough to do you know history or whatever it is so they spend half their time just getting them up to speed yeah that is hard so i'm not down on teachers and saying they are bad teachers i mean there are bad teachers but it's just they're not equipped because of their lack of experience yeah but like this is the thing the other thing is like like they are normally sort of chained to their sort of Ofsted sort of principles, yeah, and their, yeah. which they've like, they're not sort of, how can I put it? They want to teach, but they're not kind of allowed to teach because yeah. they have to hit these key markers so they can yeah. get funding for the next year and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, it's not, you know, we always have this image of teachers as, you know, the movie Dangerous Minds. Or, yeah. You know, <laughs> oh my like oh the it's teacher's like, gonna cut or lean right. on me the teacher comes in and re read different it's like no it's not like that it's just here's a curriculum teach that <laughs> yeah and like the whole thing is and like people like i think people like especially when i find kind of look back at my school days i think it's like i look at it for sometimes a little bit of rose tinted glasses if you get what i mean mm. because like oh yeah school isn't that bad um but school then and school now is a very sort of different beast if you get what i mean yeah um, yeah i, th I think it, i think i think we had less pressure mm. back then so teachers could teach like i don't hear t kids now talking about their favorite teacher in the way that back in the day you'd always have you know a few teachers that were like yeah they really you know i i got them they got me you know mm. Yeah, but you know what you're gonna do. Uh, hopefully, um, like yeah, something will like hopefully circumstances will change and things will get that little bit better. Uh, with regards to like lockdown, planet lockdown. I was about to say lockdown. <laughs> yeah. No, the planet lockdown. Uh, with you saying yeah, having kids at home, like trying to get lessons done and everything like this, trying to keep them just focused, is yeah. mission in itself. And I think. Mm. I think maybe some parents now might have an appreciation of how hard it is and maybe like, yeah, uh, tell yeah. the government to look, help the teachers out, shape up. Uh, but yeah. when it comes to a free school meal, like this government seems to be very resistant to that. Uh, uh, yeah. no, don't, don't, I mean, hey, plaudits to Marcus Ratchford, right? Yeah. For changing the narrative on that because and you know you know that was not going to happen without that kind of public pressure oh yeah no and like this is the thing and um, i've got to say uh, with marcus ratchford's effort like look i'm a i'm a lifelong liverpool fan and like look <laughs> I, I, like yes before this i would have quite happily pushed him down some stairs and like, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, like you know what i mean yeah. but like this is the thing like yeah it's good people uh, for like doing that and like look, taking that stance and like being look free school meals especially this time needs to be done and look don't get me wrong like I know money is tight in the country and like look there have been furlough schemes here there and everywhere but to feed every ch look feed every child in this sort of time of crisis I don't think it's going to cost that much like when you're like buying food wholesale like you can buy a ridiculous amount of food for a pound <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> yeah yeah I mean yeah so so you're right financially but it's kind of like what are we talking about this is feeding kids it's like yeah, it's not saying every kid should have a playstation right <laughs> you know <laughs> it's saying that if you don't provide this kids will not eat that day yeah. Or, you know, they'll be given whatever happens to be available. It's like, you know, so what I loved about what Marcus Rashford did was he really connected it in motion. And funny, interestingly, there's a speech by a guy called Lord Griffiths of somewhere, one of these funny names of Berry Down or something like that mm. in the House of Lords. He's kind of this, you know, it's just like a House of Lords guy, right? You know, nothing, you know, you wouldn't know him otherwise. But he stood up in the House of Lords and gave a speech and basically said, 
Marcus and Rashford and I have one thing in common. And I was like, okay, yeah, Rashford's like a Premier League footballer, bro. You're not. Yeah. Right? And he <laughs> talked about the fact that he had also benefited from free school meals and how what he loved about what Marcus Rashford did was he, he's, he was basically saying, look, we still feel the pain of hunger, right? It's not mental. It's, it's like in your soul that that's what it means to be hungry. And it's, you need people to say things like that because otherwise it's just a numbers game. Mm. You know, you say, oh, so, you know, um, the budgets, you know, we have got a budget deficit. Oh, well, let's cut the school meals. That's 300 million saved, you know. But if you connect it with, no, hold on. Do you know what it's like to have the pain of hunger? And not that pain of, oh, I haven't eaten for a couple of hours and dinner, my steak dinner is not till, you know, 8.30 that hunger pain of the last thing I ate was something insubstantial and I don't know when the next meal is going to be. Mm. That's like visceral, you know, so, so he did well to really connect that for people. Yeah. And like, this is the thing. I think that sort of connection and like basically needs to be brought out. I think there's a lot of things right now where it's not like connections are not being made and it's not being communicated correctly. And much of it's just, what's going on? <laughs> it's like, what, what's going on? Why, why is this happening? Why, like, you go, like, ah, oh, it's a pandemic. Okay, right? Yeah, I understand that. But now, why is this now not happening? Why is that not happening? And yeah. no one's actually sort of giving you a clear message of what's happening, how it needs to happen, and what makes sense. Because, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a lack of leadership. Uh, Boris Johnson is an appalling leader, in my opinion. So things are ambling along without any direction. So, hey, let's wait and see what happens with Brexit. That's, that's the next <laughs> thing that's going to pile on top of everything. But let's, let's not get started on that. Hey, look, come on now. Look, like, we'll be fine for Brexit. We'll have a deal. And yeah, everything will be fine. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to depress you, sir. You guys are. Yeah, <laughs> I can't. I can't even. I can't even start to address my mind to what that's going to be like, except to say one of the the best memes or kind of images I saw on Insta not so long ago was, if you think 2020 has been bad, just remember that Mad Max the movie was set in 2021. <laughs> Okay. And I was like, oh man. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, come on now. Look, I'm like, I'm resting hope on like 2021. Is there, yeah. there's a lot of pressure there, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> come yeah. on. Like, because yeah, 2020 was like, yeah, new decade. Like, like forget the new year, it's a new decade. New me. And like you heard, like I saw lots of posts like that. I even put posts out like that. Like, yeah optimism optimism and yeah two and a half months later <laughs> 2020 went oh you know what sod your optimism and just I, like felt like it throat punched everyone and then kicked us while we we're down and like yeah mm -hmm. but 2021 come on <laughs> yeah 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 let's 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 be positive right it'll be good we potentially have a vaccine so yeah. you know maybe things will be good yeah and no Mad max connotations <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry about sorry about that like you've mentioned a couple of films. I sense you might be a little bit of a ha, cinephile at heart. Yeah, I like my, I mean, I like my movies, although I don't know, I don't know if you get that many great movies now. It tends to be kind of good TV series. I think all the good writers have migrated in about the 90s, I think. They, a lot of the writers left Hollywood and kind of went to work in TV. So that's why most of the really good kind of innovative stuff you find is happening in TV rather than than movies. Mm. So what has been one of the favorite TV shows of this year? Oh gosh, uh, probably I Will Destroy You, which was Michaela Cole's um, drama. It was on BBC, I think she put it on. Just really well-written, well-observed drama um, written by a lady I think is one of the most talented ladies around. So yeah, it's probably that. Oh, excellent, excellent. I've got to say one of the things I've been, like me and my lady watched recently, um, The Expanse uh, on- Amazon. Okay, 
Yeah. Yeah, I've I've seen I think I've watched an episode. I haven't yet got into it, but uh, I'll 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 give it another go if uh, you say it's good. Uh, it sort of draws from the same sort of pool as The Wire. Like basically, okay. have you seen The Wire? Yeah, mate. Uh, the Wire is my number one TV series of all time. So yes, I've seen The Wire. Yeah, so you know how with The Wire season one release, season two ports and like yeah the education system yeah and then press and the, well was it press no four was the actual election and then five was the press and everything like this it yeah. kind of yeah. tries to break things down on that yeah yeah the the ports season two the ports was the weakest of the lot mm. but even so it's still good yes yes indeed uh, yeah, one of the things I have to ask, like you started a podcast. Uh, well, you you have a podcast. What mm-hmm. is like you mentioned? You sort of do some analysis on that. So, what is your podcast now focusing on uh, mostly? Well, it's called the Great Speech Podcast. So I focus on great speeches, of course. And also just communication skills generally. So I I often deal with different topics. Like I've covered things like uh, charisma, things like speech, great speeches by women, which is often Mm -hmm. underappreciated. And I did the analysis of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, and I'm going to do more of those. So it's it's just a podcast about all things communication, whatever. And I do interviews as well. And it's just whatever kind of floats my boat that I think people might be interested to hear. Ah, excellent, excellent. Right, I'm liking that. I've got to say, like, is there a case you can find that podcast where all good podcasts are like, put out? Yes, yes. Just type in the Great Speech Podcast anywhere, and it will come up. Um, you know, usually with my name as well. Uh, so yeah, and then just subscribe Apple, you know, Spotify, all of those look uh, like you basically. Oh, perfect, perfect. I'm not, I'm not 100 episodes in yet, so I got, I got some catching up to do. I'm, I'm sure you'll catch me. <laughs> no, no, you'll never catch me. Yeah, yeah, not at your pace. <laughs> <It's like> running, <laughs> running, always running. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the things I have, I have to reveal, yes, I'm a being of supreme cosmic power. And yes, I can grant you one wish. And yes, you can't have world peace or like, yeah, I'm understanding. What would that one wish be and wait you can't ask for more wishes or write down on a piece of paper make all these wishes on this piece of paper come real like true what would that one wish be for my daughter to get into her preferred school because she's been doing the 11 plus so that's the big thing that's going on in our household right now is trying to get her into her secondary school of choice that would my that would be my one wish Mm. Outstanding, outstanding. Like, yes. Okay. I have to say thank you very much for your time today. But I would like to ask, uh, can you tell the people out there how they can find you on the big wide wild web, the interwebs? Uh, Yeah. I mean, uh, if you can see my name anywhere on this podcast, Google that and you'll find everything about me. I'm on LinkedIn. It's kind of my social media of choice. My website is greatspeech.co, greatspeech.co. And again, from that, you'll find everything or just go to the podcast since you're listening to a podcast now, uh, the Great Speech podcast, and you'll find me and then just listen to an episode, see see what you think. Outstanding. Kalari, I'd like to say thank you for coming on today. It's been an immense pleasure, a joy. Uh, Brings a smile to my face. Thank you for having me, man. And but I'm not gonna let you call me Kolari. That's like an interim name, either Kola or Kolari. And I know you're gonna, you can do it. Choose which one. Okay, okay, I, I see that. Kola, I'll, I'll keep. I'll there keep you go. Like All that. right, cool. Like, like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's it. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you to you all who are still here. Please, my friends, my life warriors, stay safe, stay well. Be awesome, be excellent, be fantastic. Be all the positive bees you can be in this world and then some. Thank you very much. And yeah, have a great day. Yeah, peace. And we are 